ESPN's Buster only with Armin and LeVac on 104.5. The team, your home for New York sports, thanks to All-Star Wine and Spirits. Buster, the Yankees 4-6 uh, and six in their last 10. At this point, how worried are we that they could actually miss the wild card? I don't think that they're that worried. Look, oh. if you look at the state of the American League right now, um, with, the, with the Astros drifting back, the Rangers taking control of the American League West this week with a series <laughs> against Houston, it's not like there's some really hot teams that are chasing uh, chasing the Yankees. And the fact is, is that CC Sabathia's great outing his last time out, you know, I think really helped to stabilize how the Yankees feel about their rotation. And so I think that they're, you know, they're feeling pretty good about things. And I think that the other thing too is that uh, Greg Bird's done such a nice job filling in at first base for Mark Teixeira. Uh, I was talking with someone the other day about Greg Bird. I said, who does he remind you of personality-wise? And what I got back was uh, John Olerud, who, uh, you know, in terms of a guy who's really understated, doesn't overreact to everything. There's no moment that seems bigger than him. He's always calm. And what a perfect guy to have in that situation, uh, given what's at stake for them. Does he also always wear the uh, the batting helmet? I mean, is that going to be a new thing, too? Get that back? <laughs> should be a thing. I, I, no talk of that. Uh, just a lot of talk about how calm he is at the plate. When you look at you know, uh, Luis Severino and, and, and what he's done so far for the Yankees, have they have they really stumbled upon a future ace in, in Severino? Well, they definitely have someone that they care a lot about or uh, believe strongly in. Uh, I'm sure you guys heard the stories. You know, before the trade deadline, every team that they were talking to uh, was, uh, you know, basically saying, "Hey, we want that Severino kid." And the Yankees were saying, nope, 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 off the table, not going to trade him. Because the way they felt internally was that there was a chance that Severino could have as much of an impact for them as any of the trade acquisitions because they believed in his arm. And you guys have seen that, you know, with his great changeup that he has to go along with a fastball. You know, he's got the breaking ball. So he can uh, certainly do some things. And I think the Yankees had to be really heartened how – you know, he had the, uh, a strong outing against the Rays after the previous outing. He'd kind of gotten knocked around, and you want to see that in a young player. I think there's some toughnesses in him, and I think the Yankees felt that, you know, that was there all along, which is why they held him back in his innings early in the year to make him available at the end of the year. In other words, sort of the opposite of his Steven Strasburg situation. ESPN's Buster only thanks to All-Star Wine and Spirits, Greg Bird, Luis Severino, Slade Heathcott, other names as well. How much have these younger guys, these farm system guys, come in this year and been an asset to this team, Buster? It's been a big plus, and I know that there, there have been situations like before the trade deadline where some Yankee fans were frustrated because they felt like, you know, how come the Yankees aren't going out and getting stars? What was happening was, and what is happening, is that Brian Cashman, the general manager, the last few years has really tried to, uh, you know, reinvest in the farm system and to try to build it back up the way that it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago and and try to create a situation where the major league team could be helped out by the minor leaguers, and that's helped out this year. You know, whether it's a Severino or a Bird, as you said, you know, Slade the other night with that huge at bat. Um, and I, I think it's part of the reason why, you know, you've got a nice mix. And I can remember former uh, Mets manager Davey Johnson, when I he was the manager of the Orioles, and I covered that team. Him saying to me, look, every year you need one or two young guys. You need some hungry guys around the team because the rest of the group starts to get older, and you need people putting pressure on them emotionally every day, and young players are good at that. And, you know, you get a guy coming off the bench the other day like Slade did, and he's hungry and he's excited and he's in the moment and he's getting an opportunity, and you saw the response from the Yankee players to that. Buster, when we look at last night, Dallin Batances comes in in the seventh inning, and then you know through the course of the game, he ends up walking the bases loaded before he gets out of trouble. But he just he looks like he's not nearly as dominant as he once was. Is this is this just over usage? What's going on with him? In talking with evaluators with other teams, they think he's on fumes. Um, that you know this is a guy who's gassed. And last night in pitching that game and working multiple innings. It was the fifth straight day in which he'd either pitched or gotten up in the bullpen. And, you know, some teams who are especially adept at running bullpens, they uh, consider that a day when a reliever gets up in the bullpen and doesn't come into the game, they count that as a work day. 
Um, you know, the Yankees apparently don't in the way they've handled Batances. And I've been talking about this with you guys all year. It surprised me how hard they worked him. He's thrown more uh, pitches than any other reliever in the American League. And here's the number for you, okay? Mariano Rivera was in the big leagues for 19 seasons, and in that time he had two seasons, or excuse me, three seasons in which he pitched in more than 70 games. Dylan Betances is uh, fast going to, to rack up his 70th appearance this year for the second consecutive year. So oh. it's like watching a nag you know, being pushed <laughs> uh, going uphill, and they just keep going to him. And what you're afraid of is that, you know, you're talking about a, a young, talented pitcher, and you're afraid that at some point he's just going to break down. And I... I've just been surprised at how aggressive they've been. I mean, the best example of that being that day when they got him up in the bullpen when they were leading the Red Sox by seven runs. The yeah. other, and this was a few weeks ago. ESPN's Buster only with Armin and Levac. Thanks to All Star Wine and Spirits. Adam Warren struggles in his first game back as a starting pitcher. Uh, four innings pitch gives up two earned runs this week. Should they have kept him in the rotation the whole time? Uh, you know, it's. I'm not sure because I, I think that you know what, given what else they were trying to establish, uh, you know, given the fact that at that time Evaldi was a solid option for them, to me because of Warren's experience in the bullpen, it made sense that they would have him do that. You're not going to ask CC Sabathia to make that transition. You certainly weren't going to ask Evaldi um, uh, at that point to do that. You're not going to have Tanaka do that. Nova, you know, has been so good in the past. You can understand why. Um, you know, they wanted to give him a chance to do that. But now that Nova's struggling, I think it was the right move to put Warren in that role. All right, Buster. So the, the Washington Nationals are now seven and a half games back. They've oh, won boy. their last four. The Mets have dropped two. We're starting to hear some rumblings in the Mets fan base. They're, they're recalling 2007. What makes this team better and, and that it won't fade like the 2007 team did? <laughs> Yeah, and I got emails from Mets fans this morning um, <laughs> where they're basically recounting all the numbers. Seven ahead with oh, 17 no. to go. Uh, and it sounded like reading an Ed- Edgar Allan Poe when I got it this morning, right? Um, look, I, I don't think the Nationals are as good as the Phillies were, you know, the team that ran down the Mets in 2007. I think the Mets are better. I can understand the fear. <laughs> <laughs> of Mets fans, in part because we know that the the Mets young rotation is on fumes right now. Uh, you got you know Terry Collins talking about Degrom and and uh, you know maybe they're going to pull him back. We know that they've been working with Syndergaard. Uh, you know Mats is not someone that they're going to roll out there for nine innings every time. And then you have the Matt Harvey situation. That all said, I think the Mets will find a way to finish it off, and you'll be amazed at how much pressure will come off that team if they just manage to win one or two games over the next four or five days. Wow. Uh, Matt Harvey situation, is there an update of how the Mets are going to use them from here on out? Well, what uh, Adam Rubin, who's my colleague here at ESPN, does a great job covering the Mets, report is that the Mets are kind of going to use him for quote-unquote half starts. And I don't know if that means you know three innings. Does it mean four innings? Um, either way, he's not going to be available in the same way that he's been in the past. But I, I think I mentioned to you guys before that as this has played out, I still wonder if uh, clubhouse peer pressure will wind up playing a role in it because I'm sure that there are other guys in that clubhouse who've gone to Matt in one form or another, or maybe you know they've talked amongst themselves saying, "Look." You know, we're trying to win something here. Do you want? Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to come on board? If you're hurt, then okay. If you're tired, well, they're all tired. And so I, we know that 180 innings is kind of the loose framework that they're talking about. He's got 171 and two thirds at this point, which means that in theory he only has eight innings left. But if the Mets start to hemorrhage and they start to fall back. Do you think there might be some pressure on Matt Harvey to put a, put aside the innings uh, innings conversation and just go ahead and pitch? And, and I suspect that that probably, if it hasn't been brought up to him, it's going to be brought up to him in the days ahead. Buster, uh, assuming that this isn't 2007 all over again, the Mets continue on and make the playoffs, should Terry Collins be the NL Manager of the Year? 
I think he should be in the conversation uh, for sure. I, I think he's not going to win. I think that Joe Madden is going to win because the Cubs in their history and the fact that they've come so far this year, I think above and beyond. Uh, but, yeah, I think Terry's going to wind up getting a lot of second and third place votes. And I think probably most important to Terry, if the Mets wind up making the postseason, I don't know how the front office can think about replacing him. Um, I, I know that they haven't always felt warm and fuzzy about everything that he's done. But ultimately, proof's in the pudding. And if they make the playoffs, I don't know how you turn your back on them. ESPN's Buster only with Armin and Levac. Thanks to All-Star Wine and Spirits. Buster, the Subway Series this weekend. You will be at City Field as part of ESPN's coverage this weekend. Sunday night baseball. Uh, you all will have this game on ESPN Radio throughout the entire weekend. What are you most intrigued about this matchup? Mets, Yankees. Well, Matt Harvey, and no doubt about it, and and how that plays out, and you know what exactly, uh, what kind of form is this going to take place? Because you know, here's the part of it that that doesn't make any sense to me. I know that you know there are certainly compelling reasons why doctors uh, could think about limiting a pitcher coming back from Tommy, Tommy John surgery, being wary of having too many innings, but if you're going to have a, a starting pitcher who is uh, you're trying to protect, okay, and he's thrown a lot of innings, which Harvey has to this point, and then you ne- suddenly have a situation in mid-June where you're going to say, you know what, we're going to slow him down, we're only going to have him throw bullpens, we're going to have him make half starts, so he's throwing three or four innings. Are you then going to ramp him back up for October? And suddenly, you know, despite the fact that he's not going to have as much physical training because he's been slowed down in September, he's suddenly going to, you know, pop him back up where he's throwing six, seven innings and the highest adrenaline uh, possible in the postseason. Is that really an improvement over just pitching the guy and keeping him physically prepared? I think there's so much room for second guessing in the situation that short of the Mets. Uh, winning the World Series, I, I just think there's going to be a lot of bad feelings that come out of this because I don't think the Mets really have a decision that can turn out to be exactly right. And let's face it, guys, if the Mets don't wind up winning in the postseason or let's say they fall one game short, what's the conversation going to be? Well, you know what? It all started to turn when we started talking about Matt Harvey's innings. Um, and, and he's going to get blamed, and, and I – you know, is that fair? Not fair? I don't know, but I just know that's the reality the Mets are staring at if they don't, um, you know, go deep in October. Buster, what should be made out of the year that future Yankee Bryce Harper's having? Stop it! No, oh. <laughs> Buster, that's well, your fault, the MVP by the way. In the National League. I, I get it that pe- some people say you can't be the MVP if uh, you're not on a team that makes the playoffs, and it looks like the Nationals are not going to make the playoffs. But first off, there have been many, many cases where a guy's won an MVP and not been on a team that uh, made it to October, you know, whether it's an Andre Dawson or a Cal Ripken or an Alex Rodriguez. Uh, and to me, look, if, if you want to say I'm not going to vote for anybody who's not in a contending team, then to me, then at that point, then why are you putting Bryce Harper in any one of the ten spots on your ballot, let alone first place? And to me, if, you, if you're a writer – and you put Bryce Harper second on your ballot, given the fact that he leads the National League in home runs, he leads in runs, he leads in uh, batting average on base percentage and slugging percentage. If you put that guy at number two on your ballot, that's a total cop-out. If you have Bryce Harper on your ballot, you better put him first because he's been the best player. Right. He, Future Yankee Bryce Harper's amazing. Buster, that's your fault, by the way. You started that. Well, see, I knew that, and I just continued to talk right along with it. I know you Because I still think that's the case. Oh, boy. All right, let's keep moving. Yeah. Let's get to a great part of this program where I tell you that the Astros are reeling. Buster, how far could the Astros fall? Now, you're asking me this because of your deep allegiance to the Texas Rangers, correct? Uh, that might be just a little tiny part of it. Yeah, okay. And you're, you're one of two people in your area. Okay, we'll okay. run through it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, but how how big is the fall though? I mean, it's a, huge. In this uh, and they come yeah. back, and and maybe we shouldn't be surprised because there's such a young team, and you got you know a lineup where your leadoff hitter is in his first full year in the big leagues, and George Springer, and your number three hitter, Carlos Correa, 20 years old, you know, is the guy you will need to prop up your offense, and they look gassed, and their offense look gassed, uh, looks gassed. They were fourth in the majors in run scored in the first half of the season. 
25th in August, 18th in the month of September. And meanwhile, the Rangers just keep gathering more and more momentum. And I'm, you know, I, I, I gave a back one. I'm going to give you one too, Armin, here, okay? Right, I'm, I'm thinking as I make my picks that uh, I'm going to wind up picking the Rangers to come out of the American League and make it to the World Ooh, Series. So that team just gets better and better and better as the wow. season goes along. And you talk about adding experience between Cole Hamels and Mike Napoli and having Prince Fielder and having Adrian Beltre. A lot of good stuff going on there. Wow. Buster only with Armin and Levac on 104.5, the team. It, it is improbable the way they were down eight games on August 2nd. I, I think that that it takes a lot for my fan to come out, Buster. But I, I had marked them for dead. I spoke to listeners all around the Capital Region when they came up to me and said, why would the Rangers ever trade for Cole Hamels? I said, oh, because he's got several years you know, left on his deal. It's not for this year, guys. I just didn't see it coming. It blindsided me. Well, and you weren't the only one. I mean, if you remember, the Rangers actually were talking about trading Ivani Gallardo before the trade deadline because they thought that they were in a position where they were going to be pure sellers. And then they decided, you know what, let's add Cole Hamels uh, so we'll both be buyers and sellers. And then they wind up backing off and uh, just going completely to being buyers. I bet you part of that was because of the fact that they were seeing the Astros starting to fray a little bit and um, I, I, I love the Rangers' story this year because, you know, new manager Jeff Bannister's gone in there. It's their great clubhouse culture. And I love, uh, you know, what's going on with Prince Fielder. A, a life in baseball, he has it taken away from him last year when he has surgery. And when you talk to Rangers people from the first day of spring training, what you got was, wow, Prince is like a different guy. Prince is all excited. Prince has got the biggest smile ever. And maybe, you know, Prince is like uh, the Jimmy Stewart character in It's a Wonderful Life. He got a taste of life without baseball last summer, and he's come back, and he's all happy and walked into uh, his manager's office in one of the first days of spring and said, you know what, Mitch Moreland's a better first baseman than me. You ought to play him there. I'll be the DH. And that's been his attitude the whole year, and he's being rewarded for it. I think when uh, you talk about American League Comeback Player of the Year, it comes down to Alex uh, Rodriguez versus Prince Fielder. Wow. Uh, now, another wow factor for me is I'm looking at uh, at, at your uh, your article right here at ESPN uh, dot com. You got to be an insider. Uh, you've got a game on September 26th that looks pretty much meaningless, circled as a must see. What, what's going on with that? Well, what's going on is uh, yesterday the Oakland Athletics called up Barry Zito from the minor leagues. Um, you know, he's 37 years old. Uh, he's at the end of his professional career. And starting for the Giants that day at Oakland's Coliseum is Tim Hudson. And I've been waiting for Oakland, for the Athletics to get on board with this. They still haven't committed to starting Barry Zito. My question is, why not? Their fan base wants it to happen. It'd be a cool moment. Um, you know, I... and. I just think, you know, baseball has a long history of finishing up careers with cool moments. We saw with Jeter last year with the way that that played out. I've been, uh, you know, I've covered teams like when Mike Messina was pitching for the Orioles against the Tigers and Lou Whitaker and Alan Trammell were finishing up their run with Detroit. And Mike Messina basically was giving them meatball fastball so they could get hits in their final at-bats. We saw it with Todd Helton. We saw it with Mickey Mantle against Denny McLean in 1968. So... Let's, you know, I think it's time for the Oakland Athletics to get on board completely, make this happen with Barry Zito pitching against Tim Hudson. ESPN's yeah, Buster only. That'd be sweet, man. With Armin in the back, 104.5, the team. Thanks to All Star Wine and Spirits every Thursday at 515, the best of Buster today at 630. Well, Buster, look, if, if, if your prediction of the Rangers going to the World Series turns out to be all right, I won't hate you for that. And I'll let the whole future Yankee Bryce Harper thing That's slide by. Name. That's his full Yeah, name, you man. better hold on to that one, Levesque, because you know that he's going to renege on that next summer. Oh, absolutely. He's, every time I say it, he's going to flip out. So, well, like, there you Levesque go. will be like, hey, good morning. How's future Yankee Bryce Harper doing? I'm like, shut up. That doesn't even make his sense full in name. that sentence. That's like, his full name. You don't have to bring him into everything. <laughs> yes, I you do. Just, just get his name changed. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it could be his, his last name on the back of the jersey will be Bryce Harper, and his first name will be right. future Yankee. Buster, we're good with you today. Thanks, man. <laughs> Your time's up. Hey, no, just kidding. Man. Appreciate you, you, dude. Thanks, man. We'll do it again next week. See you guys.